dealing with aneurysm. Um, I've been working, basically, a lot of devices, and we're going to see that in my talk here, a lot of devices came out that have allowed us to kind of um, move into um, um, ischemic stroke, uh, which has been actually very helpful because um, when I started, I would tell you that there were large wards of uh, ischemic stroke patients that just sat there and really got no treatment. Um, over my career, um, I've watched a lot of um, development, and in the last several months, we've gotten some really good positive news about how we can treat these patients and we'll go through these cases. Uh, I'm one of the people that the, the um, articles are great, but um, I like cases, so I will try to follow everything up I'm talking about with a case or two. With the subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, like I said, that has, it's kind of gone through how I came into this, um, to the field. Um, and so we'll start with subarachnoid hemorrhage and then move into ischemia. Um, basically, um, the most common cause of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is actually trauma. And we all tend to forget that. Um, we move into becoming um, uh, a uh, trauma two center. We're going to have to keep that in mind because we'll get called to a lot of subarachnoid hemorrhages which have nothing to do with aneurysm. Um, but spontaneous um, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is aneurysm has to be thought of number one. It constitutes about, you know, almost 85% uh, of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, vascular malformations, but blood dyscrasias, and there are some crazy ones down here, um, can also lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, the prevalence is actually quite low. I remember when I was a medical student going point to do, well, when I was treating any aneurysm, I wanted the all for myself, and actually one of the neurosurgeons laughed at me when they were um, flipping an aneurysm, and he said, you have a really, um, you think that, this, um, that yours is going to be none left, and you don't worry. There's a lot of people in the world. <laughs> so, um, which is true. So, you, um, it's, um, like you said, about uh, 10 to 15 million people have intracranial aneurysm. Obviously, some of these go on, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we go into um, incidental aneurysm. People do actually live with their aneurysms and die from other causes. So, not every aneurysm does have to be treated. Uh, annual rupture rate, is, you know, again, these are fairly small um, numbers. The problem is. Is this one? Is that when someone ruptures, their morbidity and mortality is quite high. 66% of patients with the subarachnoid hemorrhage do not leave the hospital without. It. Well, many 30% do not leave the hospital at all, uh, or do not make it into the hospital, and another 30% or more do not leave the hospital without neurologic deficit. So it's a very devastating disease, uh, and uh, it's one that has to be treated very judiciously and with um, multi-modalities with their intensivists. With us and with surgery. And speaking of that, the first uh, aneurysm surgery, um, which is we call them clipping now, uh, was performed by, um, it was not clipping in uh, 1938, but um, that's what was kind of evolved to. Uh, I think it was kind of interesting because the um, being at Hawkins, um, they're very proud of Dr. Andy, um, but his first 38 patients that he did all died. And I wonder how this ever caught on because. Patients didn't live, um, but there was nothing else to offer them. And so what I ended up doing was um, they would ask them in, and if they survived for two weeks after their bleed, they felt that they were good protoplasm, and then they would take them to surgery. We do things very differently these days because um, in 2002, our our treatment, our surgeries have gotten better. Uh, traditional surgery has gotten better, and therefore people live through those surgeries. And what we were finding is, is that one of the big things is that people re-rupture and then they don't do, they have to go through that certification again and 60% of them are not going to um, make it either. So um, that, that advocated for um, this early and ultra early surgery when they first come in. Um, in 1974, we have, um, in Russia, we have the first um, endovascular treatments for um, aneurysm, and basically they were doing vessel occlusion. They are putting balloons up and just, you know, basically putting a balloon here and a balloon here, cutting off flow to that vessel um, and stopping, yeah, obviously, if you don't have blood flow into the aneurysm, the aneurysm isn't going to do anything to you. Unfortunately, that also means you cause a stroke because you didn't have blood flow to the vessel that that was, um, to the brain that that was feeding. Um, these are correct uh, predecessors, Dr. Kashima and Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Hikasashita, um, who know very well, actually, were um, they um, attached first fiber coils, and actually, I have actually seen Benson wires um, used, and all things from um, from the early 80s, um, but, um, which led to the um, development of the uh, GDC coil in 1990, uh, which is kind of our modern-day thing, and we've gotten better and better. The coils 
softer, smaller, more um, easily detached um, to the point where we have pretty much the treatment choice for ruptured aneurysm. And that came to be because of the ISAT trials that occurred in Europe. Um, basically, um, anything from um, to the treatment versus clipping, they actually stopped, midway through, they actually stopped. No posterior fossa um, aneurysms were even treated with surgery because the surgery was so morbid because of the skull base resection that had to occur, all of the cranial nerves that were involved. Uh, they just basically started coiling all those. So they really, this was for anterior circulation. And basically, um, they found that endovascular surgery was actually better. We, um, this is published, and there, we're going to have another update soon. Um, this keeps getting, this data keeps getting looked at because there was um, about uh, over 3,000 patients in this over all of Europe. Um, the neurosurgeons here wanted to kind of, well, that's Europe and this is the United States. We need some more time. We need to do our own studies. Um, basically, it was kind of interesting. One of the concepts was is that, you know, open surgery is better than endovascular because we can all the blood out of the CSF and we're going to um, take away the humors that causes vasospasm and hydrocephalus and everything will be better and it turned out it was actually more mor morbid. So um, basically we've gotten to the point where we realize that actually opening the cranium for a, uh, for a ruptured aneurysm is actually um, harms the patient more because it's actually more trauma. And so, um, basically at most everybody, if you can coil an aneurysm that's been ruptured, it's basically that's what we do these days. Um, so signs and symptoms, you guys all are pretty aware of these. Headaches, sudden and onset, very severe. Um, the meningeal signs is something that I think is um, very important uh, because um, basically no, um, there, I don't see a, migraine, a migraineer coming in and, and has a chronic sign after time. They, you know, you try to move their, um, I've had a patient whose knee was hurting because it was basically a variant of a Patrick sign with her. Um, and that is not, you're not going to see that in, um, in your severe migraineer. Um, they're not going to have meningeal signs. They might have, photo, you know, migraineurs can have photophobia and they will have a sudden and severe headache. The interesting thing is, is that when I do have someone who has migraines who then has a subarachnoid hemorrhage and I ask them, do they know the difference? They absolutely know the difference. They will tell you, this is so different. This is so, something very different. And so it's one thing to ask if you have a migraineur who you're kind of concerned. Well, it's just a migraine, or is it something different? You can um, always usually will tell you that it's different from what they're um, talking about. This is the one that um, that always concerns us that deal in the ER and deal with the patients uh, coming in. Is that this may have a warning? You know, about 50% of patients have a warning leak. Um, so the patient will come in. Well, yeah, well, mom wasn't feeling so good a week ago. She complained about a headache, but it wasn't until she went coma, to a coma with the re-bleed that we brought her in because mom didn't want to come in. I mean, those are always the toughest ones, or the ones that came in, didn't get the full work, and then come back with something much more severe uh, with neurologic deficit, because you wonder if you could have caught them when they just had the headache, would their outcome be better? Um, so basically, in, um, if we are looking in the first 24 hours, head CT is um, the, um, the modality of choice. It's easy, it's fast, it's quick, and very accurate. Um, Unfortunately, the longer the interval between the onset of the symptoms and the signs, the less likely CT is going to show you that. And we're going to trace, I'm going to show you a, um, a patient that came in here like that. If the history is convincing that the CT is negative, you should consider an LP. This is something that even some of our neurologists do not believe, but it's truly the case. And my case that we had here in this hospital about two months ago or six weeks ago, it do that absolutely. Um, MRI, if you're really concerned about it and you don't want to do the LP, you can think about an MR because MR will show blood, um, you know, that is greater than four days old. So you will start to see hemocytorin in CSF and staining along the cortex if you um, if you want to go that route. Um, this is what we um, we talk about when we talk um, about grading. Uh, it's basically Hunt and Hess were surgeons um, in Europe, and they were looking at basically at, this is an outcome score, just like your GCS. It's an outcome score. The higher the grade, the um, less likely something. This actually has 100% morbidity and mortality associated with it in the community. I have grade fives that have left the hospital that, you know, it's just some impairment, yes, but they did live. So I think that data is a little bit skewed and maybe um, a little old, but that's kind of what we're dealing with. Great ones generally are, um, these are the ones we worry about leaving because they don't think they have anything real. Um, so, and they're the ones that are going to do the best by going to surgery, um, whether it's endovascular 
muscular or coiling or flipping. So this is the um, case that we had here, um, our first uh, our first aneurysm coiling. Uh, a 41 year old woman that come um, that basically said four days before she arrived, she felt a pop in her head. Vomiting. Finally, her father says, "I think you have to go in. There's something really really wrong here, and you have to go in." So she is, gets a CT scan. She does have family history um, of a fraternal uncle who had an aneurysm. I think that's kind of, honestly, that's not what we call family history. Usually you want first two first-degree relatives to consider the family history, but she does have some history here. Um, I, I will challenge anybody to say that that's not a normal SCT for a 41-year-old person. I, mean, I read that the reading was negative. Um, you do a CTA, um, and they actually read this out as, um, as normal, which in retrospect, I I don't think it is because I think it's a little out, which is a cheater, cheater error that some people love and some people hate. Um, but basically, it was read out as normal, and she goes on to LP with 19,000 red cells in two four. So multi calls me and goes, Well, I really think that we should press for the angiogram because you know we've got a CTA and a CT that are negative. If the LP had not been done, this would have left the hospital. When I got when he, I get the history and get told, I look at them. I'm like, wait a second, there's something right there. But that's what it would have happened to her. So the LP was actually imperative for her to stay. We um, do angiogram. She had an ACOM, as was uh, predicted by that CTA. She had an ACOM aneurysm, which was had, had a horrible ultrasight in the back. Um, and we coiled this aneurysm. We actually ended up having to put a stent to maintain the ACA there. You can see it's just a little bit of spasm distal because of the stent, which actually clears out. Um, the good news is, is that she was extubated immediately post procedure. She was a great one. Um, extubated immediately, neurologically intact. Um, she actually left. Um, she's not still here in the ICU. Uh, she actually left. Uh, you know this woman very well. Um, for two weeks, um, probably because she had very little blood, kind of in that um, CT scan. She had no. Um, she had some kind of physiologic um, episodes of vague spasm, but nothing that took her to the um, to the lab. Um, angioplasty. Um, so that's how that's a um, aneurysmal rupture. What happens to the unruptured intracranial aneurysm that's found incidentally when we do with that? And basically, when we look at the Weaver study or the um, the ISHUA, um, the intracranial unruptured intracranial aneurysm trial, um, basically um, they found that there are some things that kind of we can look at. They've looked at tons of things. This is a meta-analysis, and you guys all know that there are issues with meta-analysis. Um, what they basically found was that there is some things that really do kind of hold true. Soft is very important. The anterior versus the posterior. Um, the the, the of the aneurysm. And the rate of change if they went underwent surveillance. So in circulation, excluding the PCOM. So if there's anything coming up, the inter, uh, the ICA, the so, um, MCA aneurysms, basically, um, the size has to be greater than seven millimeters because what you want is you want the risk of rupture to be greater than the risk of treatment. And the treatment is on the order of about five to ten percent. And so that's why um, you need that rupture rate to be higher so that it actually warrants doing the treatment for it. There are some arguments about this seven millimeters. It does seem a bit high to most of us that work in the room because we see a lot of these come in. As Lady just saw with the two by, well, I guess you could say it was length with seven millimeters, but we see a lot of two millimeter aneurysms coming in. And rough, so there's some question about that. In the post relation, because the ruptures are so much more morbid. Actually, is much less. They talk about four millimeters being your cutoff because if you rupture a basilar or a superior cerebellar, basically the patient comes in comatose. So that's the reason that the humidity associated with that rupture is, um, is greater. And this includes the posterior communicating artery, which I always considered off of the internal carotid artery, but um, that was part of this uh, trial. What are some of the things that um, will increase your um, your risk factors for rupture? Uh, smoking is number one in, a, in the um, familial intracranial aneurysm trial where there are two uh, degree relatives. Uh, there's a 20 times higher risk of rupture in that, um, if there's smokers. So that is the only thing. I, if you got anything else in medicine that increases your risk of badness by 20 times, that's just unbelievable. Uh, obviously, increasing age because they just have more time to push on aneurysm. Uh, 
uh, female gender, um, I'm not sure why, but there are more aneurysms, that, there's a tendency for aneurysms in women more than men, and um, it's about a two to one ratio. Um, so that's where that comes in. Um, obviously, that's in the history. Hypertension, because they're just pushing harder on those soft walls. Um, I actually put this in alcohol and drug abuse. The most important is methamphetamine, because it just it destroys um, the vessel of the walls and it connects to um, our lady that came in was a, was a drug user. So um, I know that some people talk about cocaine, but that's more because I think it affects hypertension than anything else. It, it drives that pressure up because when they're on cocaine, they have those high rates, uh, heart rates and high uh, blood pressure. So um, the symptoms that we see kind of start, you know, now these days people are getting scanned for, you know, hang out, I think, but, uh, um, you know, they get a headache, they get, a, they get an MR, and then all of a sudden we're seeing an aneurysm, and what do we do about it? Um, large symptoms can call, cause cranial nerve palsy. The most common is a sick cranial nerve palsy where they have a, um, where, they, where their eyes out and no vision, uh, but there can be motor deficits in the MCA. Obviously, headache is the one that we see the most. I have seen seizures in really, really large systems, but it does take a lot to push on the temporal lobe to cause the seizure to happen. Like I said, smaller, as we are mentioning here, smaller aneurysms, generally speaking, they commonly have no associated symptoms. If they scan for the headache, it is and they find a small aneurysm, it is very unlikely um, that that aneurysm is causing that patient's headache, and we tell them that even if they want to go to treatment, that is likely not our aneurysm that is causing that headache and do not count on the fact that even though you're treating the aneurysm, that you can treat the headache. Um, I get this question quite a bit. Why would you do a CTA versus an MRA? Um, I think that, you know, CTAs are a little bit more anatomic for us. Um, they're faster. Um, if a patient is claustrophobic or has pacemakers and all that other wonderful things, uh, CTA um, is, um, is better uh, than accurate in that patient population, but it does come at a cost of radiation and contrast. Um, um, especially for our familials is what I usually recommend if I have a patient that comes in with two family members and they're like, well, I need my screening. I'd rather do them with MR because these guys are going to have to go to serial follow-up and I'd rather compare apple to apple rather than the CTA to the MRA down the road. Um, you know, that it's, it's the, the quality is not quite as good as the CTA, but it's pretty darn good. We can, I'm pretty sure uh, um, basically four millimeters and up, we're pretty sure that we have it. And as you just saw with the WIS trial, we don't have containers that are much smaller than that generally speaking. And there's no and no um, contrast given. What are our treatment options um, for the unruptured intracranial aneurysm? Basically, we can do nothing. We can watch it. Most patients who have a two-millimeter aneurysm, as they come to my office, we, I talk to them and we do surveillance. We usually do one follow-up in a um, year's time from the first um, reason that they came to me. And then we, um, and then they know who to contact it and we tell them that they have the worst headache of life. You can call us to go into the emergency room and tell them that you're my patient so that they get called early. Um, surgical clipping, as we discussed, and endovascular coiling. So um, I'm just going to run through a quick case. Um, this was actually one of our, um, in a former job or former location. Um, she was a 36-year-old female who was one of our neuro IC nurses. Uh, she did have a very significant family history. She had headaches. I don't know if that was from the patients or from me. I'm not sure why she had her headaches, but she had headaches. She had mild hypertension, and I'm sure I created that. Um, she was a smoker, and she was black. So she had a lot of those things that we hit upon earlier. Um, here you can see this is the MRA, because we said, let's just do an MRA, like we had talked about, a familial. Um, and here you have a vascular kid aneurysm. And you see pretty darn to the, um, to the angiogram that we're showing here with the, um, the right vertebral artery injection, the basilar. Here's that nice little aneurysm off the basilar tip. Having coils out was basically took too close because she was very nervous about it after watching all the uh, patients coming in with ruptured aneurysm. She didn't want to be one of those. Um, and basically, she spent two days in the hospital. She went back to week two weeks later because she didn't want to be the heavy lifting of patient care. Um, and um, she was actually um, complete um, um, after we saw our uh, one two job procedure. Right. I want to move on to the um, to the, uh, um, the, the bigger part of the pie here, uh, the blue part, which is the ischemic stroke. Uh, basically, we look at it as um, categories embolic from um, from a cardiac standpoint, small vessel disease, 
and then large vessel thrombosis, so artery to artery embolus like carotid disease that we talked about. So I'm going to show examples of each one of these as we go through. Uh, as we discussed, this is a much larger incident. Um, you know, one in 15 Americans are going to be affected by stroke. Uh, you know, almost uh, three and a half million uh, stroke survivors in the U.S. I think that um, this is the bigger statistic. I, my husband is the big statistician. This is the one that um, that I look at because I'll tell you that these are, this is generally our older population, and what they're more concerned about is being a burden to their family and not being able to do what they um, not being able to grow old the way they had anticipated. They don't want to be needing help walking. They don't want help carrying themselves. They want to be more independent. Um, and so this is the it's the survivors of stroke that is probably more. Um, than the, um, than the deaths from stroke, to be honest with you, that, um, because of just how devastating this process is. So how does it occur? Generally, we get a blockage from a clot. I, I just swear. The, uh, so you get a you get a thrombus here um, blocking the blood flow to this vessel. You have an area of core infarct that's um, denoted in this white, and then you have what we call the penumbra, which is kind of this more grayish territory. Obviously, this is normal. All right, this is just taking a life of its own. Um, <laughs> it's having a stroke. I need to fix it. Um, so um, basically, um, when you were, are imaging these days, is now kind of geared around. Uh, trying to figure out the difference between the core infarct and the penumbra. If we, there's a large area of penumbra, meaning a large, um, an area of ischemia that can be reversed, then that's when we go forward and uh, take care of those, um, those uh, strokes. We are, I'm going to just run through these quickly. You guys probably all know these, um, but just as a reminder, ECAS is where we start um, in the um, and you're looking at uh, a TPA, um, and they're actually, even though there were people that did badly on TPA, the actual the benefit to the majority of patients actually made us go forward with TPA. It was kind of one of those things where it was kind of marginal. I know if you really look at that data, I know if we did it today, we would actually be using TPA at all. But they were better than nothing because they had nothing else to offer. Um, when we get to the United States and PRO Act in 1998, basically we moved to um, urokinase, which we don't use that, um, that anymore. I mean, some people, if you go to some old-time neurologists, they liked it better because it was more effective, but of course it's more effective than causing more bleeding. So um, there's pluses and minuses to everything as, you will, as, as we go through this. Um, but basically what they found is that there's superior recanalization. And I think this becomes all the next, all the rest of the trial is we are looking at recanalization because no matter what you what you do, it lines the vessel. The patient is you. If you looked at this through a population, the patients are going to do better uh, than if they're not recanalized. So this was uh, PROACT continued, which is the next year. Um, basically improved outcomes. Now we now we get the next part, which is the modified ranking at nine days, which um, becomes a hallmark for all the rest of the trials. Um, people. Um, if you ever go to an interventional conference, which none of you go to, um, basically they put through this device, which is called, which was our first device on market. I do remember this, this device fondly because basically it was the first time that we were able to do anything directly. We had we had PTA, but we had nothing to pull any out. And when we did this course, we were so excited because every once in a while we, we actually pull one of these out. And the patient was Lazarus on us, and we were just absolutely faint. Um, I do credit this um, company. It was a small startup company, and they did something unprecedented. They actually went ahead and did a trial to look what was happening with their device, and if they got recanalization, how that fared. And basically, when you look at it, and this is where we, what I was talking about with revascularization, if you got revascularization, you did a heck of a lot better than if you didn't get revascularized. And you have this trial to um, look back on um, from a from a um, stroke standpoint. ECAT 3 comes out in 2008, TPA, because um, we were doing a lot of embolectomies at this point. They wanted TPA to kind of give a bit more on an FDA, um, FDA approved this after ECAT 3. This is one of my thoughts coming out, sorry, from here because it's an old device. Uh, but uh, basically, I put this up there 
because even though we were doing this, um, we had a trial um, that was published in 2012 that showed that interventional management of stroke improved outcome over TPA alone. And this was a very mixed trial. There were a lot of people upset. It had gone on for 10 years. There was multiple devices being used. There was, um, if they had gotten TPA and failed, then they went on to do thrombectomy. So the time for thrombectomy was much delayed in comparison with TPA. So it was not a very rigorous trial, but it was, um, the neurologist felt victorious in that. I will say this got, this got uh, the International Stroke Conference and immediately the rib divided between the neurologist and the eventualist, and it was a that matches, see, it doesn't work, and we're like, but it, why would we want to go at 2 o'clock in the morning if it doesn't? When we get the clot out and the person wakes up, we're, we're all excited. So basically, a new device on the, on the, uh, in town at that time was the stent treever, which all of a sudden we're now at 80 to 90 percent efficacy of pulling out the clot. Um, and there are, I um, didn't update this, I apologize, there are uh, three more trials that have come out in the International Stroke Conference this year. Um, but basically, the beginning of this year, um, in January 1st, this was published. Um, this is the MR Clean from uh, Norway. Basically, they did head-to-head -head trial, very rigorous trial between MCA occlusion versus um, thrombectomy. And basically, if you take five patients, one in five patients with TPA is going to be better, where three in five patients with thrombectomy are going to be better. Is it a perfect mousetrap? No. We still have room to make this perfect. However, um, definitely thrombectomy was in um, sure four year trial that actually started before IMS three IMS three data was um full fertility. Um, very lucky that that happened because this actually um, pushes the other three trials in Canada, Australia and the United States to go to interim analysis because it's not such a benefit on the on the treatment list. Um, every single one of those had very equal twice to three times the um, improvement in patients uh, with uh versus TPA. Um, having said that, we have our three uh, big groups. These are the kind of the two that we can deal with. Um, the small vessel disease is too small for me to attack with a catheter. Um, so basically, I get, and that kind of fits with what we're seeing with the two thirds of the patients are improving with from because basically they're up here and not down to um, try to speed things along, I apologize uh, for, um, for talking too long, but um, the large vessel occlusion, uh, I want to go through um, a quick case here, 47-year-old um, man um, with his conjugate gaze. Uh, I laugh because some people have heard this one, um, basically had a glass eye, so I don't know how he had his conjugate gaze, he didn't have a glass eye, but that's what I was presented with. Uh, I picked up on the horse niche, and the thing that the ER physician was really concerned about was that he thought she was a little, he was a little squirrely, and she couldn't understand why he was numb on one side and he's on the other. Uh, she was like, I don't think this is really a stroke, and I'm like, uh, we got a basler on our hands. This is um, this is not going to be good. So I told her to go ahead and do the CTA. You can see the plain CT. It's some hyperdentine. I've seen so many hyperdentines that turn out to not be scar. I don't actually really. But definitely when you get to the CTA and you can see the contrast in the ICAs here and you can see there's an absence of flow in the back, we know that we're in trouble because we've got a bad thrombosis. So he received TPA, continued to deteriorate, uh, stopped speaking at all and became very somnolent. So we took him immediately to the, um, to the uh, angiotry. Um, see the inflammation of the vertebral artery. It not look like that that we did where you don't see the basilar artery. You can actually kind of see the thrombosis and we plugged down this minor um, vertebral artery. We were very fortunate. This was actually our first, um, we were on SWIFT trial when it went, when this dent retriever came to be. Um, and so he was our first case that we put the stent up. So you can spot, you can see where my catheter is. This is catheter going up. See the stent high. Oops. Okay, sorry. Uh, see the stent times here and here, and now you can see the basilar artery. You can kind of see all this clot sitting in here, and you can definitely see that atherosclerotic plaque. And most basilars that thrombose, only 8% of the ischemic stroke is in the basilar. This is a large artery because the food is there because of hydrogenosis. Um, so go ahead, and we pulled that clot out, and this flow that we've seen here, which is normal. Had an angioplasty in him because of this uh, stenosis, so that he doesn't have a recurrence on us because he is only 46. We didn't want him to possibly do this again on us. 
Um, and the, um, the, he actually gets out of the hospital three days later, physically uh, intact. He came into my office six months later complaining of knee pain and wanted me to take care of that. And I just kind of laughed and <laughs> my head said, awesome. I'm so happy you're here to complain about this. Um, I can fix that for you. <laughs> we'll get you to an orthopedist so I can do something about that. Uh, so it was very nice to be able to do something like this. And this is, like I said, this is, um, this is what we do. Let me continue with um, a different type of patient. This is a 74-year-old that comes into the ER with stuttering symptoms. One minute she's doing fine, she, the next minute she can't get her words. She has right-sided weakness, so this is kind of dominant hemisphere. I'm going to show you an angiogram of the right side. A little bit, you can see this is not dead contrast, but the reason I'm showing it to you is because you can see, oops, I'm sorry, I spoiled it. Get all of these collaterals coming over from the ACA trying to fill in that MCA territory on the opposite side. So it's going on over there. We thought by the CTA, we thought that she surely was had, um, had a clot over there. Um, when you do the um, when you do the vertebral and vascular artery, you can see this is the um, this is the anterior hemisphere located on the right side. But you can see all this attempted collateralization over here on the left. So this is uh, yeah, she's got. She's something flow, so we know something very bad is happening. When you look at the image, um, we think that there's actually a clot here uh, because we're not seeing any branches after um, the trifurcation in there. And she has this high grade critical stenosis of her, cur um, of her carotid in a, in a string sign. So we go ahead and fix it, put this in, and we go back up to go hunt for the, the urine to hunt for the cranially, and lo and behold, just by restoring flow, we restore flow to the entire MCA territory. As you can see, she actually does not have an A1 segment, or this tiny little thing that's really not very big. This is what we call an isolated MCA territory. Um, she needed the direct flow, and that's why she was having her stuttering symptoms. When her blood pressure was higher, she was pushing across the stenosis. When it was lower, she couldn't do that. And we've had actually a couple of patients like this already here, where we put a carotid stent in, uh, where we put a carotid stent and the patient actually did extraordinarily well, in spite of the fact we didn't actually do a thrombectomy, which everybody thought we were going to be doing because we were in the um, middle of a deep stroke. Um, so that does happen. Uh, I think this is our, our favorite our patient coming up. This is uh, cardioembolic. Um, this is our lady that, our first case here, a 65-year-old woman that was found down in her bathroom um, at 6.30. A routine where she went to the bathroom at 6 o'clock, she was actually Basically, this is untimed, right? So he wakes up, finds his wife, collapses in the bathroom, cold. Uh, she's unresponsive to the verbal stimuli. She can't talk. She has no movement on the right. She is hemming neglecting, and she is, yeah, she's homeless. She comes in. She wasn't with us. Um, basically, so she, I walked into the ER, just happened. Her stars aligned for her in many ways. Um, I just happened to walk in for completely different reasons. Uh, and the um, who I just met that at that moment, she goes, oh, well, I'm so glad you're here because there's a stroke that just came, but I don't think it's really for you because it's a wake-up stroke. Let's look at it. Let's see what's going on. So I go over there, and you saw the presentation. I said, let's run her as a code stroke. It's our first day, our second day. And let's just do it. So take her up, CT, you know, your volume loss. There's volume loss here, but there's no stroke. So it looks good. So we have that big wedge or core SCA that we were talking about. Um, when we go to do the CTA, we actually can see here's contrast in the vessel and we see an acute blockage there where, where the clot is. So we have a clot to go after. She is unknown. The CTA is completely excluded. So we then, you know, said, okay, well, I guess we'll, this is what we talked to Mr. Clean, Mark Clean, the Swift Prime, all the ones with the new trials. This is the patient that should do better because she has to come to the distribution. Kind of see some stuff here, so there's, there's no big edge out. And she's normal and hot, so let's go for it. Now, you see that she came out of CTA. This is one of the things you might see clearly is that patients, when they get contracts, they need to dilate a little bit, so they actually may improve a grade or two from their NIH stroke score. She actually starts talking, but all she can tell me is Maryland, and every question after that is Maryland. So I'm like, where are you, Maryland? So we'll 
who's your husband, Marilyn? You know, so it's like, so she was perseverating, but clearly hurt me just a little bit, which also helped me to think she has some brain default this, um, to say, because just with a little bit of debilitation, we're getting some more neurologic out, um, improvement. So we have the, um, this, um, the angiogram, and um, there's people in here that have seen this too many times, but uh, here's the internal carotid artery coming up, anterior artery, MCA. You can see there is a small shear, but the big cutoff is right there. Better appreciated over here on lateral, where's the big cutoff right there. These are all ACA distribution um, vessels, and you can see very little of the MCA distribution is actually fed. There's a branch or two off the MCA that is uh, that is that are that did anything um, that we did in the last one where you can see the spent time here and here. You actually, if you went away and look what I do, you can actually see that there's a clock sitting in the midst of this, but as slow is going beyond. So the benefit here is that even though I'm having to wait five minutes for this, the clock to intervene the descent and tertiate, basically the brain is getting what it needs during the it's getting the blood flow. So that's a, it's a good thing. Um, this is a pull out. It's about that two, and a, two millimeter, two and a half millimeter um, Booger, as I call them, but the uh, um, clot. <laughs> this, this, is, this, two and a, this two and a half millimeter was enough to cause the patient a massive dominant hemisphere um, stroke. So, yes, yeah, it's millimeters, and it's tried to, you know, it looks really there, but when you try to think about what two millimeters is, it's really tiny. Um, but this is what happens. She gets all her blood flow back, back distribution. And the best of all was when we activated her three hours later, she was in nice stroke for zero. Um, she was working from her hospital bed. She was arguing with dietary. She was doing all of the wonderful things that patients do when they're normal and way too normal for the ICU, but that was okay, like during the ICU when she was um, We did actually uh, note, um, we did actually do um, a TEE, and she had a large um, pain foramen ovale uh, with a very uh, mobile septum. This is um, when you see a young person, and I consider 65, kind of a young person with an ischemic stroke. Um, you see that you always have to think that they have they have a CFO because there's usually no other reasons for again for students to do this. We've seen about three times in five weeks where we know the CFO on somebody, which is pretty cool. So she was started on good and she actually was kept here while she was started on good because we just didn't want this first case to be passed. And so we watched her um, very carefully while she was being um, loaded up on good and um, wanted to um, go to other patients. Uh, I think I, I'm going to actually just flip by this one. This is just a different device, but you can see, I just in, for sake of time, um, got this one was kind of a cool one. This is actually a post, um, you do have a large CT um, surgery um, group. This was a patient status code they already valve replacement. Um, he woke up initially fairly well in the PACU, um, and then the physician was there and he developed right hemi parasitis. Basically, on CT, they see a clot. It actually was a calcification in the ACA, and it was probably a part piece, a tiny little piece of the, um, of the valve uh, that got fractioned off when he um, was um, being replaced. Um, and what we have angiographically is this here. You can see a little better there. Um, and I could actually see this triangular piece of calcium sitting there. And we tried to divide the whole thing up, but it's a base of that, that triangle that's kind of facing down towards us. Pole. I put the cardiographic surgeon sitting there in the, my control area going, you know, watching me like a hawk at 2 o'clock in the morning. First time I do this, the entire tree, the ACA just comes pulling at me. And I'm like, okay, I can't have this rip apart in front of my cardiographic surgeon. I'm going to be in trouble. So I had to come up with a, devise a different way. And what I did was I put a balloon in and I pushed the thing distal because I figured if the point is going it's not the other direction, I can kind of downstream. And by pushing it downstream, I couldn't get rid of the clot, but at the same time, I pushed it downstream, gave him a few more branches, and the patient actually did this really well. So at the end, we do, we do get the ACA back. But you see, we are missing a few branches to kind of brighten this distribution. He did have a little stroke, but the little stroke was a lot better than the big stroke he was having. So we considered that a win, and actually, the car, I had a good friend in that cardiovascular surgeon that night. Uh, last one I want to talk about is the cryptogenic, which is the one that we can't really treat, so it'll be really quick. Um, is a four-year-old man with facial droop. Looks like he has 
um, diabetes and hypertension, which most of these patients have, his initial CT and CTA is read as normal. So they don't do anything, right? CT and CT is normal, so we're just going to go home, right? He basically, we come to MR, he has a little um, hit in the basal ganglia. Um, basically, we do best medical management. And, um, you know, so these patients get hypertrophy of their small vessels because of the deposits from, uh, from, uh, from the diabetes. And then, in addition to that, they get pounded with their hypertension. So that, that you know, a lot of kind of thicken the capillary bed. They're either going to bleed out with those intracranial bleeds from the hypertension, or they do what is more common in the diabetics, which is these small little lacuners. And um, so we try to put them on antiplatelet regimen, which is generally just a baby regimen. Very effective drug. Um, you look at the population as a whole, 90% of patients are very, um, are COX-1 inhibited with 81 um, milligrams of aspirin daily, um, and it's very durable. Um, it lasts over, you know, they stay on it and they don't go off and on which I know some patients do, um, but they will actually stay fairly inhibited, which is actually the ideal thing to have is that COX-1. We do some statins because there's more to statins than just the cholesterol lowering. It actually does help reduce um, plaque. We do, in the um, initial, we do allow their, um, if they're very hypertensive coming in, we don't want to correct them into normal. We leave a little bit plump so that they can continue to perfuse. Um, while we start to slowly bring their blood pressure down. There are some other things um, that we, in the ICU that we do if we get into some, you know, some swelling and things like that. Obviously, we, talk, we can talk about, you know, um, we're just doing this with a um, lot of diuresis if they swell a lot. Um, the other things that we can do are craniectomy if they need it and those sorts of things. But for, for the small vessel, because they usually end up being small little infarcts like that, we can actually get away with these, uh, these three things um, pretty easily. So that is it. Thank you guys for your questions and long. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, since you brought up that, I played this bit. Uh, do you have any preference agrox, biomix, uh, aspirin? Um, if it's atherosclerotic disease, if we see atherosclerotic disease, the um, antiplatelet is the preferable method rather than anticoagulation. If it's more like um, a cardiogenic, like an AFib or PFO, then it's like coag. Um, um, I will say that uh, we have to be very careful. Some of the um, one of our patients that came in, um, when patients come off anticoagulation for their AFib and they have a procedure per se. Um, we see that it's not uncommon. There's actually an article a few years ago talking about um, stroke in that very procedural decline, like three times normal, because they, I, I've seen this where they get a little hypercoagulable because they've been on any of them. 